Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the law. My name is Joseph Akable. It is yet to become law, but already it is generating lots of controversy. Promoters of the bill make the case that it will provide a legal framework for the development of values that define nationhood. Those against hold the view that it will simply take away the rights of citizens in an unjustifiable manner. These are the matters that will engage our attention today on the law. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. And so today we are discussing the anti-LGBT law. In terms of the full name of the bill, it's called Promotion of Proper Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill 2021. And in terms of the context of the bill, it references a story that broke some months back about the fact that an LGBT resource center had been opened here in Ghana. And we, for those who have followed that story closely, recall that uh, that particular center has since been shut down. And so it also makes reference to uh, statements that have been made by former and current leaders of Ghana against LGBTQ activities. Uh, some other issues we're talking about is that the promoters explain the intention behind the bill being one, to prescribe LGBTQ plus and related activities and propaganda of advocacy for or promotion of LGBTQ plus and related activities. It's also supposed to provide protection of and support for children, persons who are victims or accused of LGBTQ plus and related activities and other persons and related matters. Those who are affected by this particular uh, bill are uh, those who identify or hold themselves out as being lesbian, being gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, or ally. And ally in the bill is defined as individuals who are promoters or advocates for persons to have these sexual rights. Then some relevant portions of the law that we'll be looking at. And so it makes the point that if you undermine proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values specified in Section 2 of this Act, that amounts to an offense. And so what is proper sexual human rights? It defines it as uh, being with a binary sex categorization of male and female assigned at birth to the physical, emotional, and psychological well-being and enhancement or healthy growth and development of the person, especially where the person is an adolescent or a youth. And so it goes on to uh, give various things that you are entitled to. You are entitled to various materials that in, ensures that you develop in a manner that's expected of you, but has quite an interesting uh, restriction there. It goes on to make the point that if you think that this is a law that is coming to deal with individuals who may hold themselves out as uh, being transgender or being gay or being whatever, then you are entirely wrong because there's a bit about those who may assault or abuse individuals who identify themselves as such. And so it states here under 22 one that a person commits a misdemeanor if the person, whether verbally or physically, abuses, assaults, or harasses a person, A, accused of an offense under this act, or B, suffering from any gender or sexual identity challenge, including LGBTQIAAP+, or any other variant of a sexual identity a challenge. And the various sanctions are indicated below. And so it's quite an interesting piece of bill. And I'll be joined for today's discussion by uh, Dr. Edwin Coleman is a research fellow at the University of Johannesburg, as well as Justice Abdullah is a law lecturer at the University of Professional Studies in Accra. And the topic for discussion today, we asked the question that the anti-LGBT bill stifling free speech or criminalizing uh, choices. And we'll be delving into this discussion shortly. But first, we have a bit of the discussion that has transpired since uh, this particular draft bill leaked in the public domain. private members bill is seeking to do is to cover the whole spectrum of being queer, of being homosexual, and addressing them adequately. And so anybody who falls foul of any of the spectrum uh, designations of homosexuality will be infringing upon our laws and the requisite sanctions will apply. It's a bill that imposes jail time, even jail time on persons who met out extrajudicial treatment to homose alleged homosexuals. I mean, what part of the bill is harsh? I mean, except you want us to pass a bill that is celebrating the illegality, tell me what part of the bill is harsh. All those threatening the members of parliament who are leading this bill, please be warned. We cannot be threatened in our homes. This must be stated loud and clear to those who have come to do business in Ghana. 
those who represent their countries and think that they are right. We also represent our country. And they will never, they can never dictate to us as to how to live or not to live in this world. And I'm very clear in my mind that this house, the Parliament of Ghana, will pass this bill as soon as possible. I have gone through it, and I'm sure, and I will confirm what Honorable Sam George has said, that this bill will be a reference point for many, many countries. It's very detailed, very comprehensive, and really a bill that you can refer to as Justice. And so first you heard from Sam George. He is one of the promoters of this particular bill. You also heard from Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumanu Babin. We can take a listen to some views on the streets of Accra here about this particular development. You know, we are African. And wherever you are, you have to buy by the culture of the people. And as Africans, we don't believe in what? In a foreign culture. If the foreigners want to be go by that, that is fine with them. But Africa, I think it would be very bad for somebody to engage in such an attack. Yeah, it's very, very bad. No, 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 at all. They are representing us in the hall, in parliament. So all the mass agree on, that's what they should go by it. They cannot take their own personal hall decision at parliament. They are representing us there. So what the masses are saying, I think that's the right thing we should do. Personally, I don't support it. Uh, with the new bill that will be being passed, I think it's in the right direction. Because looking at the purpose for this bill, it will ensure that such practice is condoned. And not only that, offenders are also punished for that act. But there's one thing that I would like us to all put our minds on, which is such practice is something which already happens in the family settings. For example, there are certain families who are shielding their children from this kind of practice. They know very well that their children are into such acts at that tender age. But in terms of education and the form of punishment to give to their children, is something they themselves are not aware of because they themselves don't even understand that. That such practice, one, to me personally, it is an evil act. Unreservedly, it is an evil act. I stress in capital letters. So with the new law which is being, when it is passed, and I pray that it is passed as early as possible so that its implementation is also one thing that we need to look like at it. Oh, I believe it's, it's something that I really, really support it because this gay and lesbianism issue, it's really, really bringing problem in Ghana because they always think due to human rights, they are using this advantage to just take things for granted and stuff because they don't know better than God. God created man and he gave woman to it us and they should have fun due to what, how and what they want to do. So you can't tell God you know better than God because you have to take your mere female or male to just have fun with. I think I don't support that. So I believe what the bill is bringing on board and I really support it 100% for that. Personally, I think um, those in LGBTQ also have rights. And then for the bill to be passed, it means that their rights are going to be infringed because they have the right. I mean, they, have, they should also be allowed to live their lives. So personally, since it hasn't been passed, I don't think passing the bill would actually give them that freedom or the right to live. So he had some views there. I'm joined, like I indicated, by Dr. Edwin Coleman. He's a research fellow at the Center for International and Comparative Labor and Social Security Law at the University of Johannesburg. He joins me via Zoom. Doc, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me, Doc? Yes, um, I can hear you now. 
Okay, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. We also have a Justice Abdullahi from the University of Professional Studies here in Accra. He's a senior lecturer there. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Abdullahi, for joining us. Thank you so much. I, I want to start with you, Mr. Abdullahi. I mean, uh, where do you stand generally on the bill? I just want to get a sense of your position on it generally. I, I say unequivocally that I'm absolutely in support of any bill that seeks to criminalize um, lesbianism, gayism, and all these other forms of um, sexual expressions, um, so long as they are illegal and do not um, seek to express the God-given human gender um, at, at, on the day of birth. Of course, exceptions um, may be allowed in such instances as medical officers may, um, for instance, identify. However, anything short of that, I'm completely against it. It's sinful, it's unnatural, and it's ungodly. To that extent, I completely, um, I am in complete support of this bill. And um, um, of course, if there are, uh, as I've indicated in the time past, if there are indeed few um, areas that I, that needs retuning, why not? I'm, I'm available for discussions on that. But generally, I'm in complete support of anything that seeks to advocate for the legalization of anything relating to lesbianism and gays. And, and to that extent, this bill is a fantastic one. Um, indeed, it's one of the few private members' bill that I, I once again, but that angle alone um, has my complete support. Um, and the positive bit of it being the fact that it is completely um, seeking to illegalize any form of sexual orientation that is not natural. Thank you. We'll come back and interrogate the specifics shortly. Uh, but Dr. Coleman, I mean, do you agree with the view that it's a fantastic bill? Um, I don't agree entirely. And my position is very simple, that any legislation or statute that seeks to limit fundamental rights the justification for that limitation must be well grounded in law and jurisprudentially sound. It must be logically coherent. It must be empirically sound. And the fact must be coherent as well. And when you look at the bill and the memorandum as well, there are so many aspects of it which I believe is filled with conjecture, is not um, properly uh, grounded in legal reasoning, it is not supported by fact and statistics. So to put it into context, my position is that if there is any law that seeks to limit any rights of individuals, the foundation for that law must be sound. It shouldn't ooze emotions. It shouldn't flow from a point where it is retaliatory in character but at the same time, forgetting that there are Ghanaians involved, etc. So that's my position of the law. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me start again with you, uh, Mr. Abdullah. And uh, the question I'm asking is that, I mean, when you take a look at Article 21 of the 1992 Constitution, it's very clear on the rights that it guarantees for citizens. So you have freedom of speech, expression. Uh, it's, uh, you have freedom of thought and conscience and belief, which includes academic freedom. You also have the freedom of assembly. There is also the freedom of association, among others. Under the four of this particular article, it makes the point that, yes, we can restrict those rights, but it gives certain requirements that says that if legislation is made to restrict in that regard, provided that uh, it is in the interest of public safety or public order, or is something that are reasonably required in the interest of defense and public safety, public health, or the running of essential services, such a law will not be said to be inconsistent with it. And Dr. Coleman made reference to the legal justification for wanting to restrict uh, such rights. I mean, from your reading of the bill, do you find that uh, this constitutional requirement has been met such that the law will not be contrary uh, to the constitutional injunction? Absolutely not. Um, as you rightly pointed out, our constitution allows for positive discrimination. And positive discrimination looks to matters that the constitution considers to be to be lawful. In other words, even where... 
Let me bring in Dr. Coleman while we try and fix their connection to uh, Mr. Abdullahi. Uh, Doc, you, you were making a point about, and I just referenced Article 21, the rights that it entitles people to and how when you are going to restrict those rights, it means that there are issues of public safety, there are issues of uh, public health, there are national security concerns, all those things. Uh, you are saying that you don't find such a justification in this particular bill. Um, the point is that um, when you are seeking to restrict uh, fundamental right, in addition to what has been stated um, in the Constitution, there are some underlying principles that one has to consider. What I find, what I find very amusing about this law is that it is not only restricting one particular right. So if you are restricting a right, one of the things that you need to look out for is the, is the very nature of that right you are seeking to restrict and the extent to which you can, whether constitutionally or statutorily, limit such rights. What I see in this bill, I don't see any justification. I don't see any form of legally advanced argument that can be put across to say that we are limiting this fundamental right of people. Let me make this point very clear. What this bill is seeking to do is that it is addressing an overly complex situation in an awfully simplistic manner, if I should put it in, in simple terms. So, for instance, if you only rely on freedom of non-discrimination or that a person should not be discriminated against or upon, what about the personal liberty of the person? What about the dignity of the person? And if you look at the bill, you see that there's a focus on one particular fundamental right, even though the bill sort of uh, permeates or cuts across other fundamental rights. So if I take that position that no justification has been advanced to ensure that one, the dignity of people cannot be arbitrarily uh, infringed upon, the personal liberty of people cannot be arbitrarily infringed upon, the freedom of expression, the freedom of thought, the freedom of speech, etc. You cannot just use one a unilateral approach to say that you are restricting fundamental rights, about six fundamental rights. You are restricting you are restricting it just on the grounds of non-discrimination. It doesn't it doesn't find any grounds in law at all. Well, I mean, Doc, there are, there are those who disagree vehemently with you, and I have heard arguments. They make reference to. Article 39 of the Constitution, I'm referring to the directive principles of state policy. And it makes the point that under the cultural objectives, it indicates that subject to clause two of this article, the state shall take steps uh, to encourage the integration of appropriate customary values into the fabric of national life through formal and informal education and the conscious introduction of cultural dimensions to relevant aspects of national planning. Now, if you read the memoranda that accompanies the bill, it makes the point that uh, it will provide a legal framework for the development of values that define our nationhood. The promoters are simply saying that, look, we are meeting the directives, principles of state policy by ensuring that the cultural aspirations of the nation are met. Is this not justification legally for such a law? Okay, so bef before you can um, just rely on cultural values as a justification to limit uh, fundamental rights, we need to understand what is going on in the context of this bill. After a critical read of this bill and the memorandum, I characterize the issues in three main ways. The first issue is majoritarian morality. The second issue is public health uh, issues or concerns. And the third is the fact that we are promoting African cultural uh, values. Now, this position has been touted uh, so much by people, but as academics, one of the things that we need to always interrogate is that when you say cultural values, are we talking about cultural values now? Are we talking about cultural values then? Or, or we are talking about cultural values as a continuum in the, in the context that it evolves with time. What I did was that, um, and there are a lot of academic texts into it, and you can also put some logical reasoning into it. The argument that this does not accord with our cultural values 
we need to also understand that our cultural values does not promote hate. Those are the things that we are trying to take out of this whole thing. One, when we go back three colonial times, there are academic studies, anthropological studies. In fact, they've gone deep into um, pre-colonial times to assess sexuality, um, same-sex relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And from an African um, cultural perspective, um, there is this academic text that has found that, yes, there were instances where under African um, custom, um, same-sex relationship, even though not legalized, for want of a better word, it was tolerated, and the person gave some reasons in the context of for, for purposes of war, um, farming yield, and expression of um, the diverse nature of our Africanness and of our humanity. So, if you tell me that the justification upon which you want to rely, this case is on cultural values, there shouldn't be any um, uh, any form of ambiguity whatsoever. What form of cultural values are we talking about? Because historical facts allude to the fact that um, the African traditional society um, promoted social inclusivity, and that included same-sex relationship. And I have mentioned there is in the cost in the context of the Ghanaian law, um, there is evidence that yes, um, Ghanaian law did not explicitly promote um, same-sex relationship because there, there are some customary laws that um, categorize the type of sex. But what the Ghanaian customary law did not do is to ascribe a punishment in the form of criminality to it. So if you talk of sociocultural values, um, we don't have to make it seem as if our Ghanaian society has not at any point in time in solidarity and in promotion of our humanness um, um, included these same sex people into uh, our sociocultural fabric. The academic texts are there. These are in high impact journals. These are in high impact journals that are peer reviewed. So I, mean, I don't I mean, understand Doc, why. Doc, if I get yeah. you right, I mean, you are, you are making the case that we can't objectively, or the data from times past does not support the case that this is actually something that is alien to our culture. Is that your argument? That is exactly the point, because yep. there is academic text to that effect. I'm not the one saying Yeah, But, but there, are those, there are those who make case. the argument, Doc, that as far back as 1960, when we we're having for ourselves the Criminal and Other Offenses Act, uh, we decided mm -hmm. that incest was an offense, and we criminalized it. And so the argument they make that, OK, look, if you are saying that it was not part of our cultural values from the past, culture keeps evolving. We have gotten to the time that as a society, we've decided that this is not something that in meeting our cultural aspirations, we are going to allow to fester. And so we are going under that particular directive principle to say that we are going to restrict it and we want to criminalize it. Um, which part of cultural, cultural values are you talking about? The cultural values that seeks to exclude Ghanaians for In fact, if you read the memoranda of the bill, which I realize you have done some analysis on, the memoranda of the bill makes the case that Ghanaian culture mm -hmm. admires family. And by family, they mean a man getting married to a woman and having children and be living in that way and developing. Those are the values that they said is admired in terms of part of the society. And so our constitution allows us to aspire to attain those cultural values. And they believe that it's long overdue that we have a law that criminalizes people who push things that are alien to our values? Um, what are alien? You see, this is, this is what I don't get in this entire narrative. For you to say it is alien in our values, I have given academic justification, I've given a historical antecedent to say that it is not alien. Let us do some logical reasoning here. It is when the British came, or the, um, let's say, colonialism, that unnatural canal knowledge was introduced. To do some logical deduction, why are you banning something if that thing did not exist? I want to ask you, why are you banning something if that thing does not exist? I mean, society evolves. Society gets to the point where crime festers. We feel that, okay, look, we have the laws. We need to tighten them up. 
and to just deal okay, with the loose no. ends. No, Joseph, you are not you are not addressing my point. Why are know. you criminalizing something if that thing did not exist? This is a logical deduction. I am attacking the point you are making that this is alien to our society. And I am trying to tell you that academic anthropological studies have been conducted into this. This is not something that is being foisted onto us. In any case, I am saying that Ghanaian social values does not, oh, let me put it this way, always promote inclusivity, non-discrimination against people, their respect for the fundamental human rights of individuals. And you can see it in most of our cultural values and all that. The idea of respecting individuality, individual choices, even though it might meet a communal, communal end whatsoever. So my point is basically simple. We cannot restrict fundamental rights when what we are basing our restriction on is academically unsound and factually inaccurate. That is the point I'm trying to make. Let, let me bring and in, me, Doc, let me bring in uh, Mr. Abdullahi. Uh, Mr. Abdullahi, if the connection is, is better this time around. I mean, the question I had asked you earlier on was about the fact that uh, the bill, in simple terms, attacks various, various rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution. And the Constitution provides that there should be some justifiable basis to provide those restrictions. I was asking and I've been having Dr. Koma make the case. In his opinion, he says that he doesn't think the bill has responded to that legal justification. And I was asking you earlier whether you find a legal justification for us to curtail the right to promote and advocate for various things, to be part of associations that seek to advocate for such things. Hello? Yeah, Mr. Abdullah, go ahead. Please let me know if you can hear me. I am packed. Mr. Abdullahi, go ahead. I'm asking whether you hello. find a... Hello, Mr. Abdullahi. We're having challenges with uh, the line to uh, Mr. Justice Abdullahi. We'll, we'll try and fix that and, and, and come back uh, to him. But, I mean, you've been hearing Dr. Coleman, who has been uh, making the argument that as far as he's concerned, uh, we don't, there's no legal justification for these restrictions that we see imposed. I mean, uh, Doc Ades will obviously push across the reduction you had absurdum arguments to say that, look, if you don't want us to restrict such rights, if you don't want us to criminalize, and you say it amounts to uh, discrimination and all sorts of things, why not open the floodgates? Let people engage in prostitution. Let's scrap that law off. It's, it's a crime that does not really harm anyone. Let's go ahead and let people engage in incest. I mean, that law is very old. It's not necessary anymore. Sorry, I didn't hear the question again. I was asking I those who advance uh, the arguments, the reduction ad absurdum, the point that, look, if we are going to allow such a law, if you are not going to allow such a, a bill to be passed, then we should uh, open the floodgates completely, let prostitution be, let all the other rights that people have to decide that they want to uh, get married to their sisters and brothers and all those things to be allowed. Okay, so um, if you are... If I'm to go back to this whole thing about limitation of rights, um, I have done some studies into it. For instance, when people have the right to choose and make choices in the context of what they think will be in furtherance of their personal interest, um, that actually falls under the, the, the right to human dignity and also to some extent the positive aspect of personal liberty. But the point I want to make is this that the very foundation of limiting rights comes from so many angles. And in the context of what you are saying, um, let me give you one, for, one um, um, justification that will, for instance, debunk maybe prostitution or incest whatsoever. Um, if you look at jurisprudential studies, it is generally accepted, even though it is arguable, that even though people have choice, there are certain instances of where, when they are making that choice, um, um, the state can intervene because the state sees that choice to be harmful to the bodily integrity of that person. This is what we know generally as legal paternalism. The confines of it has been, has been um, debated variously. Um, but the point is that the state can intervene in fundamental rights no doubt about it. But my case is 
if we want to restrict human rights, if we want to restrict individual rights, we need to ensure that we have a justification that is properly grounded and sound. I don't see anything like that in this bill. I don't see anything like that in this law. For instance, let me give you an example. In, in the memorandum, they state that 18.1% in terms of HIV infection um, is from same-sex people. Logically, what about the other 81%? What about the other 81%? If you look at the memorandum and the bill carefully, my position is clear. We can restrict whatever that we want to restrict. But if that restriction is not well grounded and justified, the fact that the Constitution says we can justify fundamental human rights doesn't mean you can just take anything from anywhere to say that, yes, this fits within our social cultural values. So let us use it to restrict fundamental rights. Okay, In doc, order for doc, us to do this properly. Okay, Doc, hold on. Let, me, let me try the connection to uh, Mr. Abdullahi once again. Uh, Mr. Abdullahi, so I was asking about the legal justification for wanting to restrict some rights in this particular new bill. Do you find any legal justification? No. Hello, Mr. Abdullah, go ahead. What's that? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Abdullah. Kindly go ahead. No. Thank you, Tony. Um, the, we should not pretend that the argument um, which Doc is making, which I've had other few um, legal personalities make, uh, around oh, the um, homosexuality is a human rights issue. Um, I completely differ from that. It is not a human rights matter. It is not a matter that can sit anywhere well with any institution in particular. Um, we do not see how a criminal act becomes a human rights matter. Um, I, I'm afraid um, if, if you make that argument, it probably if you go somewhere in the Middle East and other parts of the world, they'll probably also tell you that, well, that terrorism is a human rights matter, so they probably should be allowed to engage in terrorism. Um, um, and then there are those who would also make the argument about... Um, I, um, I, I respectfully stand to differ. Because I mean, Doc, if you could kindly hold on for Mr. Abdullah to land, then I come back to you, Doc. The, Doc. Hello, Doc. And the absurdities will continue. Mr. Abdullah, go ahead. If we go... Will you continue on? on Joseph? Hello? Yeah, Mr. Abdullah, go ahead. I'm listening to you. Thank you. Now, if you go on with that kind of argument, we'll continue into absurdities, and, and we probably will never... But what we need to understand from our constitutional framework is that this whole act of homosexuality is unfounded in law. And we have one of the most forward-looking laws um, in our criminal code when it says that anything that has to do with sexual orientation or the expression of sex is completely unlawful and to that extent should be punished in law. Now, if you have this, I do not even see how anyone can justify argument that we do not have any legal basis for criminalizing homosexuality. Because this is fundamental in our law, and anyone, in fact, criminal law 101 will tell you that indeed we have this thing together with the cause. We'll still try and, and get a better connection. The to... next thing I need to state, I mean, in reaction, this one is in reaction. We'll try and, and, and rectify that line. Maybe let's just try the phone lines and see whether we can have a, a, a relatively stable connection uh, to Mr. Abdullahi. And I just want to read something, uh, Doc, if you are still on. I just want to read a quote from Justice Amwasechi, who was speaking in the case of uh, the MPP versus IGP. He says, most of the restrictions on our liberty, which after years of repression, we have come to accept are inconsistent with democratic norms. Except in a time of war or when a state of emergency has been declared, it cannot be right for any agency of executive to suppress the free expression of any opinion, however unpopular that opinion may be. The believer in absolutism and anarchists, those who support and those who are opposed to abortion, those favor and those who oppose equal rights for women, 
yes, lesbians and homosexuals too are all entitled to the free expression of their views and their rights to assemble and demonstrate in support of those views and to propagate those views. And this is a case as far back as the early 90s. And Doc, uh, and you and deal and in the human rights space um, a lot. Um, let, me, let me respond briefly to the point uh, Mr. Abdullah made um, about terrorism. I don't see, I see a serious disconnect here um, because in the context of same-sex relationship, there is an underlying thing about the consent of an individual. I do not see how this argument can transform to the form of terrorism when another person has not consented to be born. In any case, when you try, there are some there are within frameworks that um, that can that can be achieved. But let me come to your point. To say that our constitution does not allow or same-sex relationship is not allowed. I think it can be dubious in the context because one, we need to understand the very framework of our constitution and how it works. One article that I will make mention of is the article on fundamental dignity, human dignity. If we go into the meaning of human dignity, which I've done some studies into it, and underlying them is the choice of an individual. And this choice, it has been extended to include benefits. As to whether you would include same-sex relationships, that is why we are having this discussion in any way. And in any case, if a criminal law are somewhere um, precludes people from acting in a certain way, does that justify the restriction on free speech? Does that justify the restriction on freedom of thought? Does that justify the restriction on freedom of expression? The point I am making is categorically clear. In order for us to restrict fundamental rights, we must make convincing arguments. And that argument about HIV, that argument about African values, that argument about trying to create a moral code for Ghanaians, it's unfounded. It's unfounded in law. It doesn't have any basis whatsoever. If okay. you want to create a moral code, let us, let us criminalize adultery. Okay. You okay. see the number of women who will be happy. Okay. Let us criminalize um, fornication. That okay. is the point I'm trying to make. It. I mean, you don't attempt to restrict a right by by giving flimsy, if I would say, flimsy excuses. And these excuses are all targeted at um, um, be, at the West, European Union, and the rest. Let us deal with the issue. Let us address the issue. I want us to go back to the drawing board. How they even arrived at the criminality of this case, I don't even know. Let uh, us go back to the drawing board. Let do, us do, if you could hold on a second for me. It. If you could hold on a second for me, let me bring in uh, Mr. Abdullah. He's joining us on the phone line this time around. And uh, Mr. Abdullah, I just wanted to draw your attention to clause 18 of the bill. It, it simply does not allow persons uh, who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, when they even want to adopt children. I mean, it's saying that they shouldn't be allowed uh, to adopt children. I mean, I don't think we have any that such requirements for any other individuals who are perhaps criminals, who have who are armed robbers, who have committed various crimes, uh, is, is this not an overkill? Hello, Mr. Abdullah. Yes, I, I think we can hear me, Joseph. Yes, I can Joseph. hear you. Yes, go ahead. So this is the point I was making, that we have a constitutional framework that does not allow the system of festering um, and uh, um, uh, progeny, as it were. And so if, you, if I limit my discussions with the particular question that we've asked, the answer is that an expert, yes, because expressly, even where you find a child in a brothel, he may not be engaged in that. He may be a daughter to any of the persons um, in, within that um, brothel. But the law empowers the state to take that child away, to take care of that, that child, so that he, is, he or he is not influenced in future to join that particular league. Now, in the same vein, if you find your child within armed robbery, I mean, an environment that is affected with armed robbery, 
clearly the law would allow the state to take that child and take care of this child just so that the child does not become a number one. It is the same way. If we have a system where two persons who are sexually disoriented taking care of another child, and this in particular, and this particular is about their own, it's even worse. This child would be literally be taking the lives of the, 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 the adopted parents' lives up. And the state cannot allow that simply to go on. Now, having answered this question, now, my point about Doc's position telling us about um, how one literature, which I have never read yet, um, would rely on that to justify the inclusiveness and, 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 and inclusiveness and indeed acceptance of homosexuality in Africa. And then seeks to say that simply because a law was passed in 1960, it means that we accepted and adopted homosexuality as part of our life. I think that is the most preposterous argument I've ever heard in my life. Laws are passed not just because they exist within the jurisdiction that, um, that the action being, being prescribed exists. Laws are passed into the future sometimes. They are passed sometimes also to correct an existing wrong. And indeed, there are times where they are passed to also correct a past wrong. And so simply on the basis of a law being passed in 1960, did not in, does not in any way justify a conclusion that it is because we had accepted homosexuality or because it existed. And so because it existed, uh, we shouldn't be hypocrites about abolishing it and that it is only the English that came to abolish it on our behalf. That is a wrong analysis of law, I mean, wrong analysis to make in the first place. Because laws are not passed simply on the pages of an existing fact or on the acceptance of that fact. Indeed, it's only because those facts are not accepted. That's why these laws are passed, to prescribe them completely from being exhibited. Now, this is why I love this, the new law. The new law does not seek only to protect and indeed criminalize homosexuality. It seeks to also completely criminalize every action that seeks to promote it. And this is the most beautiful part of it. Any conduct, any form of advocacy, any form of um, mannerism that would seek to promote sexuality, homosexuality is sought to be criminalized by this law. I mean, now, if you I tell mean, me, me, Mr. Abulai. If you tell me, now hold on, hold on, let me finish with this because my line has not been good so far. Let me, let me explain this. Now, I have explained already that we have, we have one of the most robust forward-looking laws under our criminal law when it said that all forms of unnatural cannabis Canon knowledge is wrongful. Now, what that meant was that any form of sexuality was criminalized, but it was still limited. It was still limited. In fact, if you if you really want to be go deeper into that law that said that all form of um, homo, um, um, unnatural canon knowledge was wrongful in law, it simply would even include in your interpretation the fact of even using your finger to express your sexual desires or, or gratification. However, this wouldn't have had an impact on other forms of sexual expression. It wouldn't have had an impact on the promotion of other unlawful sexual expressions within this jurisdiction. Mm. Four or five young men have stepped down, stepped through all these angles, and have come up with one of the most beautiful parts of our law. That seeks to I mean, criminalize the promotion of it. And then indeed, all other angles that would have been a loophole for people to probably have um, 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 to run away, I mean, in fact, literally escape the, the, the rough of the law. And somebody is arguing that this is wrongfully how? I mean, simply because one, I, but one article that was probably read and possibly analyzed by two, three other persons sought to justify that in the past we had somebody or we had some people out of a 35 million, even at the time, let's say 6 million people, Ghanaians. So one or two persons who had this kind of sexual orientation lived with that and nothing legally happened to them. And so because of that, on the basis of two or three or even ten examples, events of this nature, you seek to say that logical deduction would justify the existence and practice of homosexuality among six million people. That is the most illogical analysis I mean, to ever, I mean, I ever had on TV. 
I mean, I mean, I mean analysis. Mr. Abdullah, I, I'll come back to Dr. Coleman shortly, but Mr. Abdullah, because you were off for a while, I was just uh, in between the discussion. I read something from the case of the MPP versus IGP, uh, where Justice Amwasechi made a point that the believer in absolutism and the anarchist, those who support and those who are opposed to abortion, those favor and those who oppose equal rights for women, yes, lesbians and homosexuals too, are all entitled to the free expression of their views and the right to assemble and demonstrate in support of those views and to propagate those views. I mean, we cannot, we are, in this bill, we are not even going to allow people to even tweet on social media that, look, I think I see nothing wrong with homosexualism. So, so, so what, what's your question? I'm asking you that. Is this, is this not too uh, broad a restriction that we seek to impose? Not even allowing people to even express their view that, they are in support of lesbianism, just, just expressing a view even on social media. You see, this is exactly why, this is exactly why I, I posed the question. Should we allow armed robbers to also go on the street and demonstrate against the Ghana police and indeed the government of Ghana that their fundamental human rights, which is what? Their right to economic freedom, their right to, to, to exercise their economic freedom, i.e., go around, rob, make a living out of it. This is a fundamental human right. And that is even recognized worldwide. It's a global recognition. Unlike homosexuality, which is still a debate out there. Should you allow them to also go on the street and demonstrate? Should you allow people to identify themselves as Anne Roberts simply because there is a freedom of expression? Should you allow people to identify themselves as all other manners and um, all other forms of I mean corrupt persons in the street? Should we allow corrupt politicians to also demonstrate that their fundamental economic human rights are being trampled upon? Is that, what, is that the argument being made here? I mean, doc, Dr. Koma, let me, let me come to you. That, uh -huh. but, hold on, Joseph. My point here is that no crime is lesser than the other. Until the day that we decide to decriminalize homosexuality, which I completely do not foresee ever happening in the history of empire in, the, in, my, in my lifetime, and not in the life of this country. Until that day, I do not, and I would never advocate, allow, and seek to be in support of anything that is in line with persons engaging pure criminality, to be allowed onto the street, whether or on social media or any other form of media to express their disgust and demonstrate to join the support of the unlettered that their rights are being trampled upon. And what is that right? Their right to criminal, but their right to perform criminal activity. I mean, Dr. Coleman, I'm sure you have a lot of points you like to touch on. I, I saw you shaking your head consistently. On, uh, just, on, just, just tie it down for me systematically, point he after kept point, on Doc. mischaracterizing my issue. He kept on making statements that are unfounded, um, saying that one article, does he know it is one article? Does he know it's a collection of articles? No, I don't test. In an academic spectrum, at least we know the foundation, our tools in academia. And that is the research people have conducted. And if people have conducted this, and they have come up with a conclusion to say that, no, this claim that this is alien to our society, because that has been the propaganda out there, that is not the case. And these, and these articles were not just written some few years ago. They were written even before um, the Constitutional Review Commission um, started its own issues about um, um, gay rights and the rest. And so I don't know how he kept on mischaracterizing my, my argument. My point is very simple. And you are come to the issue of freedom of speech. I don't know what is beautiful about a law restricting the people's right to, to speak, express. I don't know what is beautiful about anything. Maybe he can direct me to an academic text or even a case law or whatsoever. I don't know what is beautiful about it. Now, let me take my time to recharacterize the issue about freedom of speech. This is what the bill has done. You cannot tweet on social media. You cannot do anything. Whether in some party, not just in support, whether in some party, whatsoever. Now, the law creates a foundation upon which um, the Ghanaian family values are. 
apart from this foundation, if you say any other, other thing that is contrary to this foundation, it attracts penal sanctions. I, please, please work with me here. I want to show how this is the most ridiculous law I have ever seen in terms of free speech. The moment you say this is the only thing you can talk about and that any other thing is that is inconsistent with the law, okay, you are basically compelling me what I can say. Nowhere in the history of English common law has that ridiculousness been, been exhibited? Nowhere. And Mr. Abdullah, you show me where. Nowhere in the history of English common law have we done that. And you said that is beautiful. The foundation of our very democracy, which is about free speech, people expressing their, their views, expressing themselves, expressing their thoughts, people um, um, presenting contrary argument or contrary position to debate. You said this is beautiful. Oh, come on. Come on, come on. If you people do not have any cogent argument as to the reason why we should restrict the, uh, we should restrict and impose uh, um, sanctions on Ghanaians, if you don't have any cogent argument, you people cannot use backdoor when there are academics in here. When there are academics in here who can criticize what you are talking about, where in the memorandum, where in the history of English common law, can the law say you can only talk about this? You can only talk about this. Is that a compelled speech? Where does that happen? Please. I mean, Doc, uh, just in wrapping up with you, I uh, just this point. I mean, one of the insets that we played, it's had the Speaker of Parliament uh, make the point that he has looked through the bill, and this bill is a very good bill, and the bill will be passed. I, I was just wondering, I mean, from the perspective of rule of law and uh, the Speaker of Parliament, the role he plays in Parliament and everything. A bill that is yet to even come into the House for any proper deliberation to even commence. He says the bill will pass. I, I found that a bit worrying. Is that a view that you share equally? He shows that this bill, where the bill is coming from, is very um, misconceived. In any case, um, I will not fault the Speaker of Parliament because the Speaker of Parliament is not an academic. The people I can fault is the academics who are telling me that compelled speech is beautiful under Ghanaian law. Those are the people I have issues with. The Speaker of Parliament is not an academic. He has shown his prejudices. I don't have any problem with that. That is the beauty of our democracy. But we cannot go and sit, make a one-sided law to say that because some people elsewhere have said their view that we should legalize, we are legalized, forgetting that the consequence of our legalization is against Ghanaians. I don't know where this is coming from. In any case, I'm sure we are going to create um, gay prisons as well. We are going to put people in prison. They are gays. Let us uh, create gay prisons as well. And this I mean, is the most ridiculous law I've ever seen in the history. And I have studied some law. In fact, I have studied a couple of a few in, in, uh, about Ghanaian law. I, this is the most ridiculous law that I've ever seen to say that you are compelling me as to what I can say. And anything that I will, I will say that is contrary to what you are saying, I can say. It's a criminal offense. Come on. English common law does not allow that. That is contrary to our foundation of, of, of our very legal system. Let me, let me come to you, Mr. Abdullah, and wrap up with you on this. I mean, uh, in a nutshell, I mean, sum up your arguments for us and if you have any reactions to uh, the points that have been articulated by Dr. Coleman from South Africa. Um, I, I think Doc should recognize that um, making a law for a country goes beyond pure academic discourse. It is to regulate and shape the life of a nation. It is to ensure that a country advances based on the aspirations that the country has um, um, uh, 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 accepted to be governed by. And so we have in our constitutional law, principles um, of state policy, all of which we seek, um, the objectives for which we seek to attain. And the law being made is in line, all the laws that we seek to make in this country, indeed, whether good or bad, are all geared in, um, towards the achievement of our state policy. And so to the extent that the laws being made are not contrary to the principles in our state policy and indeed any constitutional provision, 
if anyone feels strongly in disagreement of a law that's being made, I think that's why we have a I mean, Supreme Court to, to make an interpretation of. However, where a law seeks not only to advance our belief in the Almighty Creator, and in addition, seeks to give us a civilized society devoid of the negativities of civilization, I think people like him, whether in academia or in the legal field or wherever they find themselves, should be the one giving this country that standing ovation for standing up to, to, to people who are interested only in getting us to the wrong path. To that extent, Joseph, I would insist that I am in complete support of this law. If there are any minors that we believe genuinely that it needs to be discussed, debated, I am all for it. But I will never throw away the baby together with the bathwater because this is one of the most, the best intentions I've been expressed in this law. And I would urge that we push forward with this law, notwithstanding any disagreement from any corner. Of course, unless that disagreement is genuinely born out of the particular circumstances that we can all debate and then see how best to fashion out the best way out of it. To that extent, Joseph, I wish all of us a better country, and now so I would urge all of us to support this bill, um, um, with the exception being minor ones that may probably be looked at. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abdullahi. There, a bit of messages that have come up in terms of our stream on Facebook. Uh, Grit Lemon says, How about all those nice persons in political suits who are raping their own daughters? That's the question you're asking. Rape is already an offense, like we know, under Act 29, the Criminal Offenses Act. Another one here says, uh, those, those who don't agree to this law, you can go out of the country and practice that your devilish lifestyle. Uh, that is John Tay who tweeted that. Another message here. Uh, says, ask yourself, why have they criminalized polygamy but forcing us to accept homosexuality? Massa, let the Lord take its position. That's stage K. Farrell with that particular one. And so, lots of messages there. Uh, this is all time will allow us. It has been quite a riveting discussion hearing from Dr. Edwin Coleman all the way from South Africa and also Justice Abdullahi, a law lecturer here at the University of Professional Studies in Accra. My name is Joseph Akable. Do join us same time next week for another riveting discussion on a topic of interest to you.